Hi, I'm George Dory, and welcome to our Coast to Coast AM YouTube channel. Have fun, tell your friends, and share us with everyone. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Coast to Coast AM's mobile app. And always remember to log on to our website at coasttocoastam.com for daily articles, the best paranormal information, and all you need to know about your favorite guests. And now you can become a Coast Insider directly through the Coast mobile app. We welcome our international listeners and even offer a free two-week trial. So don't delay. Become an insider today. Nick Redfern back with us, his latest work, How Anti-Gravity Built the Pyramids. Nick Redfern back on Coast to Coast AM. Nick has been interested in UFOs since 1978. His main area of research centers around determining what has been learned about the UFO subject at an official level in Britain. He has spent hundreds of hours at the Public Record Office in London, has uncovered thousands of pages of previously classified Royal Air Force, Air Ministry, and Ministry of Defense files on UFOs dating from the Second World War. Nick is the author of a number of best-selling books including Men in Black, Personal Stories, and Eerie Adventures. His latest work is How Anti-Gravity Built the Pyramids, the Mysterious Technology of Ancient Superstructures. Nick, always a pleasure. Welcome back. Hey, George. Well, thanks for having me on again. How have you been? I've been good, yeah. Yeah, I'm doing well and um, having a good time. (laughs) Super. Tell me your interest in the pyramids, Nick. Well, it's something that goes back um, a long time because my grandfather um, was in the Second World War and he was actually stationed for a while um, at Egypt. And that's sort of what really got me interested in sort of ancient archaeology. And I sort of took that further and further and um, and pursued the, uh, the sort of connections to the UFO subject and and that's basically um, how it began, really, for me. Nick, how do you think and why do you think the knowledge of UFOs in the knowledge of the pyramid structures just seems to have vanished? Well, I mean, this is an, an important thing because, you know, we're, we're looking at um, gigantic stones, huge buildings, and we have no real understanding of how the the work was done, who did it, why it was done. And in other words, we know very little at all. <laughs> all we know is that the the situation basically is um, like we're looking at the pyramids today and we realize that we cannot do what they could do back then. And um, so I thought about, well, surely there's got to be a way to find the answers rather than just, you know, sort of black and white, oh, well, it's this or it's that, you know. Um, And so what I've done with the book, which the title's How Anti-Gravity Built the Pyramids, and the, the subtitle, The Mysterious Technology of Ancient Superstructures, that sort of gives you an idea. But the book... Basically, uh, George, is a look at how massive, huge blocks of rock and stone could have been created, and particularly even more incredible, how it could be moved for huge distances on the ground that would really simply be not be possible thousands of years ago. So that means there has to be another way to have moved those stones to uh, put them into place hundreds of feet in the sky. And, um, and to sort of give you an idea of um, how this sort of works, it's known as um, acoustic levitation. And it's something that's really coming to the, uh, the forward um, right now. And I'll just uh, make this, uh, give you this uh, quote from uh, Marie Jones and Larry Flaxman, right. uh, friends of mine. And um, they have looked into this as well. And the, the Joan Flaxman team present the phenomenon as, quote, two opposing sound frequencies with interfering sound waves, thus creating a resonant zone that allows for the levitation to occur theoretically to move a levitating object, simply change or alter the two sound waves and tweak accordingly. 
so that's the that's the simple version of it. But basically, what we're talking about is using acoustic, excuse me, acoustic, 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 yes, that's the word, right? <laughs> um, acoustics, and um, and if you look at a lot of the ancient um, stories coming from South America, um, Australia, even Europe, all over the place you can find stories that relate to um, of strange sounds, um, sometimes a whistle, um, a rumbling, but all of these sounds could reportedly or reputedly um, allow these stones to be sort of elevated into the sky. And if you look into it, um, the whole issue um, of the way this works is that by using sound, you can manipulate rock, you can make stone uh, of multi-tons. And, uh, and I'm not, ex- you know, not exaggerating. Nick, where do you think these large blocks of stones came from? Well, again, that's an important question because um, if you look um, at a lot of the, um, you know, the key uh, places and issues in, in around the world, you know, you've got um, South America, Central America, um, Native Americans. Um, we've got a lot of um, data that allows us to understand that um, there are so many people back then who were en- extremely, um, you know, I- intelligent, but we know very little about them. And really, if you think about it, it should be the other way around. You know, in the 20, uh, 20, uh, 2022, you know, we really should be looking at it from the perspective that it should be us who should be who have been able to um, achieve this um, rather than, you know, it being achieved four or five or six thousand years ago. You know, everything is sort of like, um, you know, the wrong way around. But um, I think one of the most important things about this is that, as I said, the more you look into these stories, um, they do sort of really come together. Um, I'll just sort of um, explain by that. I mean, if you if you look at, for example, at the the whole issue, you know, of the pyramids. Um, I mean, I I, I I particularly you know use the title of the pyramids, but I mean, you know, there are sort of massive structures all over the place. But um, the more that um, you know, we start we we look into it, the the less and less we seem to having the answers apart from acoustic uh, levitation. And um, and to sort of see this um, sort of happen, if you like, um, you know, for me, we're dealing with a, one of two things. One would be um, extraterrestrials, and another one, an intriguing one, would be an ancient human civilization that um, possibly went extinct, or possibly, mm-hmm. you know, some of this technology was deliberately um, hidden. And so, and then, but of course, that then leads us down into another path. Well, why would the technology be held uh, or hidden? Or if it wasn't hidden, well, what did happen to it? And what is, and why is it that we've lost the memories of this phenomenon since uh, the times of the Egypt to to basically to right now. You know, we, we really don't know much in that period, the pyramids to now. It's very much sort of a gray area. What's so baffling to me, Nick, too, is the fact that not only are these blocks of stones massive, but they moved them from a long distance, but they had to literally pull them out of the ground. Oh, well, yeah. I mean, there's one classic um, aspect of this, um, a place called Baalbek. Um, it's in Baalbek. Lebanon. Lebanon, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah, well, Baalbek, uh, an ancient city in the Becca Valley, um, going back to around about 9000 BC. Now, 
this is sort of almost impossible to believe, except it is, uh, it, it is believable, what I'm going to say now, is that um, in 2014, excuse me, 2014, um, in that same area, um, a huge block of stone uh, was found, and the weight was 1,650 tonnes. And there are uh, several other stones of similar size and of similar weight. And I mean, I mean, you think about that, 1,650 tonnes, um, and that's just one block. Now, some people have said, well, you know, maybe they just carved the stone and left it there. But if you look around the whole area, you know, the, the, the people of that era, we're, we're building um, structures all the time. So what would be the reason just to leave that block and not do anything with it? It's obvious to me that that huge, gigantic stone, um, well, all of the, those huge, gigantic stones, um, I think, for me at least, um, it demonstrates that, they, that they st these stones would have been used uh, to create a building. Now, to try and build something that weighs uh, of the tons of like 1650 tons, I mean, you know, there's no way that we can do it ourselves today. And um, so for me, at least, um, the story of the Becker Valley and Baalbek is, is the perfect one for me that demonstrates that um, there's just no way that the human race right now can do what was done back then. And, uh, and that ties in as well also um, with um, the, 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 the Egypt says as well. The fact that we can find very similar um, ways of building and also the buildings being huge in size. Um, for me, that demonstrates that although we, maybe all these different um, cultures weren't all together, but they all knew something about pretty much the same thing, the way how to, to create these stones and, and allow them, if you like, to elevate into the sky. Edward Leed Skelman, a frail man from Latvia, lived in Homestead, Florida, built Coral Castle with some blocks of stone that were as big as the pyramid blocks. He did it all by himself. How in the world did he do it? Well, yeah, this, this is a really interesting story. Um, <clears throat> Ed, as he'd like to be, to, uh, be, to be named, um, Leed Skelman, um, he was someone, a, a, a citizen of uh, Latvia, a country on the uh, Balkan Sea, and eventually gravitated over to the United States and and settled in Florida. And um, and we and what we have now is the famous Coral Castle. Um, and what's particularly fascinating about Coral Castle is that um, it was um, built by Ed himself, and the the massive stones that he managed to move and uh, erect and um, put them on other stones on another stone, and nobody really having the ability to see him doing this. So it's it's a really strange but fascinating story. Now at one point. Um, when uh, he was at the height of his work and people were really sort of learning, wow, what's this guy doing? You know, how is he doing it? At one point, he made this um, interesting quote. I have discovered the secrets of the pyramids. That's right. And have found out how the Egyptians and the ancient builders in Peru, Yucatan and Asia, with only primitive tools, raised and set in place blocks of stone weighing many tons. So Ed clearly knew something and knew a great deal. Um, and it's, for him at least, it all went back to the, the era of the pyramids. Um, but he was um, sort of reluctant to go any further. And, um, 
and he's, he really did um, go to his death um, without having um, sort of, um, you know, he provided us, you know, with the with the answers. But um, there's another part of the story as well. Um, if you read the full story, it's very much like a love story as well. Ed and um, and his wife, um, or as she was going to be his wife, um, that all fell apart, and um, it was actually turned into um, a song. Um, <clears throat> by Billy Idol called Sweet Sixteen. He That's was fascinated right. by right. Ed's life and story and um and his love life as well and um and and uh, Billy got a um a, a hot um a song, you know, and well, uh, well they say that the Nick that the that Ed built that coral castle for his uh bride to be that never mm-hmm. happened. Yeah, I mean, it, it's one of these fascinating stories that um, almost kind of, you know, you wouldn't think this could happen. You know, it, it, it sounds like just a story, but it isn't. And um, Coral Castle, I mean, it, it still, you know, has numerous people, um, you know, going there all the time. And the good thing is you can still see those stones and appreciate the fact that, wow, how, how did this guy do it, you know? Acoustic levitation. Tell me about it, and what do you think it is? Well, I'm I'm very much in line um, with what um, Marie and and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, we looked into at the start. Um, for me, what I my view is that we are talking about acoustic levitation. It's kind of like um, the opposite with a magnet. You know, if you've got two magnets and you push them together and they push away, well, you've got the space in between which allows you to pick something up. Now, acoustic levitation um, does work, but the problem that we have right now is the fact that the... The, the, all we can really pretty much lift and uh, or elevate, however you want to put it, um, we can only really do it with something the size of a, like a like a coin, um, and that really isn't going to do you too much, you know, if you want to build a building, you know, or a pyramid. Um, so what we're looking at is something that is starting to work. But I have to say and admit, right now, um, we are in the very small early stages. And um, and how long that will take, you know, we don't really know. I mean, to give you an example, um, you know, there's no doubt in my mind, at least, you know, that we have found the proof. And the proof is in the, the sort of the ancient um, stories. Um, and... So I think from my perspective, um, we've got the answer. What we haven't got, though, is the science behind the, the right. answer. Was it horns? Was it humming? What do you think it was? Sorry, say that again. Were they horns, humming? What do you, what do you think created the sound? Well, I mean, it's, it's not so much it need, that it needs the sound, but it's the, it's the, it's the issue of acoustics being able to sort of um, modulate um, small items in, in different um, directions, up and down. Um, now, we, can't, we cannot do that, you know, uh, apart from putting these little stones together, um, you know, like I said, like the size of your, your fingernail or something like that. Um, but um, if you look back... For example, um, one uh, classic example, Bruce Cathy, um, he was um, a ufologist back from the 1950s, and um, he he came to believe that there was what he called like a, a worldwide grid, and he came to believe that this was um, the the answer was so uh, pretty much um, on the same line. Um, Let me just give you a quote that he made. Um, um, He said, the the huge Egyptian stones that were struck by a rod whereupon 
they would move through the air the, dis the distance of one bow shot. There is only one answer to the riddle of such construction methods, anti-gravity. So, um, Kathy, mm. um, as I said, a very well, um, very, very good pilot, and um, he was someone who realized that, um, that going back thousands of years, there were rumors and legends of certain devices um, raising stones into the sky and pushing them almost like, um, like a small boat in the water and then just pushing it away. And, um, and if that was true, and I think it was, because these stories can be found all around the world, um, that makes me believe that, um, that what Cathy was talking about with his grid is what today we now call acoustic levitation. There was a fellow by the name of Morris Jessup, who was in the 1950s, was a ufologist. Tell us about that story. Oh, yeah, well, that's a really weird story. In fact, it's um, a sinister story, I would say, as well. Um, Morris Jessup was someone who, again, got into the uh, UFO subject in the 1950s, and he began to um, get a deep interest in anti-gravity. And that was one of the issues himself that um, he had a real passion for, to the extent that in the mid-1950s, um, the U.S. Navy actually um, visited um, uh, Jessup and wanted to know where he got this information from. And um, Jessup was someone who, um, you know, who pretty much back down, you know, when uh, he was speaking to the Navy. He was, he was petrified, <laughs> you know. He was, he was, he was worried that, um, well, what's going to happen now? You know, the Navy's coming to see me. Um, but basically what happened was that they wanted to know where he got this um, data on acoustic levitation that the U.S. Navy was doing way back in the 50s. Now... Jessup, the further uh, uh, way uh, ahead, the uh, further he went ahead, um, what happened was that um, he got more and more intrigued by it and more and more excited until he was found dead um, in the, the front seat of his car. Mm. And, and this is a very uh, weird part of the story because the night... Before he was found dead in in his car in a Florida park, um, he was in you know in good spirits. Um, he was actually due to go out with one of his friends the the night after, and yet we find um, Jessup dead the next day. And there's actually a lot of weird little aspects that makes it to look like it was sort of um, not a real suicide, but uh, but a planned suicide if you like but not by Jessup obviously but by somebody else um, suggesting you know possibly even a murder and um, and that era the 1950s you could find a lot of data um, about um, acoustic levitation anti-gravity um, and then it kind of um, sort of went away a bit and and now it's starting to come back again now I was going to say, Nick, are we working on acoustic levitation now as a science? Yes, we are, actually. I mean, a lot of people um, are doing a great deal of work um, on this, um, this subject because it's be mainly because of the potentials, you know. Um, and so th there's multiple, in fact, you could say there's multiple um, companies now are looking at um, acoustic levitation, if you just Google it, you know, you'll see, and you don't have to even, um, you know, have put the, the pyramids or anything like that in the story. You can find how um, today's scientists are looking into this. Um, but again, the problem is we're not really able still, even now, to raise anything pretty much more you know, than, than anything like, like you, you know, the top of your finger.
Nick, uh, what do you think happened to the technology? Well, that's one of the important things. Um, now, what we know is that, you know, into sort of the um, you know, 13th, 14th century, you can find a lot of stories um, of people who could levitate and, um, and could move stones. And, and you can find a lot of legends from the UK, not just um, in relation to Stonehenge, but also in relation to other parts of the UK where people were able to um, raise small stone, stones and then bigger stones um, in different parts of the UK. But then suddenly um, it stopped. And, and that sort of phenomenon of stones all around the world um, sort of being raised here and there, it just... It, pretty much just was came to a complete end and uh, and again that that's something we don't really know and um i think there are two possibilities um one was lost that somebody wanted this technology not to be found for us, for us. or the other one um is that it's it was lost which is a possibility as well um so I think those are the two possibilities. Now, well, what about number three, Nick? That it wasn't lost, or someone wasn't holding it back. It simply flew away. Well, I mean that could that could be a coin, you know, a possibility as well. Um, but something happened that changed the situation. From you know, with with all the like, for example, for exact um, like Baalbek you know, and um, and places like that, you know, and the, the Egypts as well, you mm-hmm. know, and the uh, Egyptians and the pyramids. I mean, it, I think if you look at it, you know, we see back then the technology and the structures that were built were done far better than they were, or they are today, I should say. And for those reasons... Um, I think we were dealing um, with one of two things, extraterrestrials or highly advanced humans who, for whatever reason, um, also possibly um, just vanished. Nick, is there a tie-in with the Sphinx and the Great Pyramids of Giza? Well, I mean, that's an an, an intriguing um, issue because um, some people have suggested you know, that there's one date for the pyramids and what a greater date um, for the Sphinx. And if that is the case, and we could prove that, that would really sort of, um, it would turn history on its head because it would push things not just back, sort of like 10,000 years, but it would demonstrate and show that if it was done by humans... But um, it would show us how the, the human civilization had gone back. On the other hand, if it was uh, an extra extraterrestrial comp- component to it, then that would be even more amazing. And it would also demonstrate that we have no real um, understanding of who put the Sphinx together. Um, and that in itself is, is fantastic as well. It's, it's the the whole thing's an amazing story, Nick, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, the, the more you look into all these stories, you know, the more you get to sort of see these sort of parts coming together and and realizing that history doesn't seem to be what it really is. You know, I mean, to give you an, an example, um, we just uh, sort of talk about Stonehenge for a couple of minutes. Um, you know, it's, uh, that's probably the most sort of famous standing stone or circle of stones in the UK. Right. And um, and now it's nowhere near the, the size, you know, of the pyramids. However, um, there's something really intriguing about Stonehenge, which ties in with the whole issue of acoustic levitation. And um, as I said, Stonehenge, not that high. 
And you might think, well, it wouldn't take too long to put that together. But what a lot of people don't know is that Stonehenge is in the, um, the county of in, in England of Wiltshire. And a, a lot of the stones um, had to be taken from a place called the Priscilla Mountains in Wales. And those, the stone that was brought to Wales, uh, excuse me, the, the, the stones that had to be brought to uh, Wiltshire um, to be uh, put in place, um, the distance was 240 miles. And the, whoever put together Stonehenge had to move those stones from Wales to Wiltshire, um, 240 miles, and some of those um, those stones uh, were, were, were weighed uh, 25 tons. So you know we're looking at a situation. You imagine that you've got multiple uh, 25 ton uh, weight um, stones being pushed across mountains, not across roads or anything like that. <laughs> no, no, nothing like that at all. Um, and you're going through mountains, possibly even snow and rocks, for 240 miles. Uh, and again, things that, like that, it's just not feasible. And, and again, there are rumours um, of the, the stones becoming light and, uh, and again, uh, levitating. So, again, for me, um, if you look around all the world, pretty much, you can find um, variations of these stories and a lot of them or most of them um, relate to this issue of stones becoming light, being able to move them along. Mm -hmm. But then suddenly, like I said, it all just goes away. And that's, that's one of the most baffling things about it. It's, um, it's here one minute and it literally was there almost the next time. I want to thank you again for being on the program. You're always invited back, my friend. All right. Thanks, George. Nick Redfern, his book is How Anti-Gravity Built the Pyramids. Great. The Coast Mobile app is now available for download on iPhones and Android devices. You can become an insider directly through this app. This is a great option for our international listeners, and new users will also receive a free two-week trial.